Hey, brothers and sisters, um, we're gonna we're gonna do a fun one here uh, today. I was uh, listening last night to the Hagman and Hagman show on Blog Talk Radio, and if you're not familiar with it, they generally do um, shows that are current about uh, the new world order or um, you know the corruption in the governments of the world as well as they do a lot of faith-based programming, Christian faith-based programming. And they get a whole range of guests. Uh, Tom Horn, uh, Steve Quayle is a frequent guest. Uh, Pastor Langford, the list goes on and on and on. But you get the idea. Bill Solace has been on there, different people. Well, last night was a show about Steve Quayle and an employee of his that's uh, taking all this Steve Quayle has spent like 40 plus years uh, writing books, and he tends to do it about uh, the giants that have been on Earth, the angels, the gateways, the portals, sort of the the mystery stuff that nobody wants to talk about from the Bible. He's spent tons of time looking at that, and um, you know, not all of his theology. Uh, thrills me in regards to end times events, but um, he certainly seems like a very committed soul to to his faith. And so I don't want to do nothing but, uh, you know, lift up the fact that I'm sure he's uh, one of the Lords and just another member of the body here. And um, what the show was about last night was really uh, bringing in this employee that Steve Quayle has and they were both talking about um, the history behind these giants that had been discovered, the skeletal remains, the physical uh, evidence for the giants, and tying it back into the Bible. And, um, you know, I just, I like that topic anyways, because, again, it's not something that the church would touch with a 10-foot pole, and yet it's all over the Old Testament. I've got that playlist called Tinfoil Hat. And even with that, I missed a whole bunch of the verses, but it uncovers, you know, this huge issue that existed um, both before and after the flood of these giants who, you know, corrupted the world and, you know, genetically were apparently trying to corrupt the uh, seed of Adam so that, you know, the Redeemer couldn't come forth and that continues on until today. And so, like I say, there's been uh, a lot of work done there. Now, they pointed on the Hagman Hagman show last night to an interesting book. It's uh, called Earth's Earliest Ages. And the author was George Pember. And he was, he lived uh, in the mid to late 1800s. And, you know, they kept talking about how incredible that book was. And I have the book. And I, I agree there's, especially if you think about for the mid to late 1800s, uh, he was talking about all these issues um, about giants and the pre-edemic world and all these things that people, again, today are, I think I would say they're they're starting to recover some of that, uh, but it's definitely you know held away from the church is just being too far out there to believe. So what I wanted to do is because they got into this is pull a little bit from the Pember book, pull a little bit from prior studies that I've done with. Uh, Chuck Missler does a good job on a lot of this stuff as well. Pull a little bit from the the uh, blog talk radio show. Pull in some stuff I've had from my prior studies and the videos. And just paint a picture. And there will be a lot of biblical stuff in here. We're going to go through a lot of verses. But I'm also going to take a look at some of the supporting non-biblical work a little bit. And just leave this out here as you know, place setting for you then to take and do further study. Um, and because it's such a big and overarching topic, 
we're going to have to leave it there because I could easily get into this and do a two hour video and I still would feel like I hadn't, you know, gotten my arms around the whole thing. So this is kind of like a framework video to get you going. And then hopefully if you think this is really interesting, you go, you go further on your own. So let's start. Um, and the first big notion is that there was a pre edemic uh, civilization in the world. Sorry. Um, and pre edemic just means prior to Adam. And we're going to say, um, you can either say pre Noahic for, uh, you know, uh, sorry, um, antediluvian for the pre flood. And if you want to say pre Adam, it's pre edemic, um, is the way the terminology works. Now, that might blow your mind because people say, hey, sin and death didn't enter until uh, the fall, until Adam and Eve fell. So all that's hocus pocus, it isn't biblical. And so we're just going to challenge that a little bit here in the beginning just to get you looking at the actual Bible and what it says, okay? So let's look at Jeremiah 4, verse 23 to 27 first. Okay, um, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Uh, I'm gonna, yeah, one more. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet while I will not make a full end. Okay. And it goes on. Um, and he just, God just confirms that he's going to do this. Now, if you listen closely, there were some interesting things in here. First was he makes this description that the earth was without form and void. And that's identical language to Genesis 1, which we'll look at in a minute. And the heavens had no light. Okay, so that's a condition. Um, and the mountains and everything moved. But get this, and I beheld in lo... There was no man, and all the birds of heaven were fled. Well, <laughs> hold on, back up the truck. Um, you know, if the earth was without form and void, and then he's right away talking about that there was no man, that's fine. But then that the birds of heaven were fled, meaning there were birds before there was man. Um, and that presumably... Uh, happen is because of some judgment here that happened that made the earth without form and void. So, and it's, look, look at this, I beheld and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. Well, hold it. How can you have a fruitful place uh, that becomes a wilderness? See, and the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. You know, now we're talking about cities. Um, for the whole land, say, the Lord shall be desolate, and I will, yet I will not make a full end of it. And so there was some major destruction of cities, <laughs> fruitful places, and there were birds in heaven, and yet there was no man. And uh, all that happened um, became desolate by the Lord. And then the earth was without form and void. Now, if you think I just mangled that up, please come here and read that for yourself. Um, it's definitely implying that the earth laid without form and void and the heavens had no light, meaning the, the stars and the planets didn't give light. And then we hear that there was hills and stuff that mo had moved and there was no man and the birds had fled. And it certainly applies that this is all because of the presence of the Lord and his fierce anger as well as the cities. So the Bible definitely is telling us something here. Now let's, 
Let's just go to Genesis 1 and dig into this a little bit more. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. And um, I'll just pull this um, definition actually from uh, the Pember book. But this heaven that's being used here, uh, the Strong's on it talks about uh, the lofty sky, perhaps the visible, visible arch in the, which the clouds move, as well as higher ether where the celestial bodies revolve. And that's what Pember got in his studies is it's most likely the starry heaven that it's actually outside of the firmament as it's described. And it's talking about, you know, the, the stars, sun, stars, that type of thing. So behold, God created the heaven and the earth. Let's flip back. Okay. And uh, the earth was without form and void. Now, the next thing that George Pember gets into when he diagnoses this thing is this and implies that it's the next thing or the next idea. So it wasn't like, here's, here's an overarching statement for all of Genesis 1, that God created the heaven and earth, and then you're going to hear about exactly how that happened. No. Um, the way the, the uh, Hebrew works on this is this was the first thing that occurred. And now this is the first thing that they're talking, the first event in the list that they're talking about with earth. And so it's the next thought, not that this was a, an overarching statement for the whole chapter, but it was this happened. And now the next thought is talking about, and the earth was without form and void. Okay, and so this is the interesting part now um, because, let's go back into the Strong's, you got without form, tohu, and void, bohu, um, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And uh, tohu and, and bohu represent um, desolate as in terms of being destroyed. Now let's take a look at this, the thing that's talked about as was here, because this is Strong's 1961, because this is part of it here. Um, this 1961 here, this was, primitive root to exist, that is be or become or come to pass. Okay, that's the definition. So let's, let's use that now. Let me take off the Strong's. I'm sorry if this is hurting your head. <laughs> And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And so we have the earth, and the was was became or be, um, yeah, became. So the earth became without form and void, and that form and void was a desolation and destruction is what's implied here. So you get what you get. What's going on here? Let me just see if I can condense this down. And the earth was, or became, or come, came to pass, without form. And now look at tohu means uh, to lie waste, and bohu, uh, a vacuity, um, ruin. See it, undistinguishable, ruin, or emptiness, or void. And so, there definitely implies that something was destroyed. Um, because it became without form and void. And that's where it uh, drives you right back into this Jeremiah 4, where it tells you that birds existed and cities existed, but yet there was no man before the tohu, bohu uh, form without form and void occurred. So I, I hope that connected for you. That's that points to something significant existing before um, verse two. Now, this is talked about as the gap theory, but I hesitate to say that because so many things have been thrown into the gap theory. And all I'm trying to do is to say 
that what did we learn in Genesis here that God created the heaven and the earth and then at some point it became without form and void it became a desolation it became destruct you know thorough destruction and if we point to Jeremiah 4 where that exact same language is used we see that there was birds existing cities existing but no man okay there was mountains existing water and um, that, I guess that's let's just leave it there because I hammered that down but uh, I think that's just a, a good jumping off point for this study uh, now we're going to take a look at uh, one of the words in particular and um, so we said was here is really you know the the Hebrew word implies become or come to pass and then if we look at with this without form um, this is the tohu and it's a uh, h8414 this is what I love about this uh, e sword you can do a quick search on it in the Old Testament and let's just take a look here first one we'll look to is Isaiah 24 10 and we just want to look at other usages in the Bible and um, 24 10 here <clears throat> the city of confusion is broken down uh, every house is shut up that no man may come and so you can see here uh, you could translate that the city of destruction but you can see there something existed a city and then it was broken down destruction whatever so you can see the notion of <clears throat> that it wasn't just an empty voidless mass that it was something that got torn down into you know a a waste wasteland let's look at 3411 but the cormorant the bittern shall possess it the owl and also the raven shall dwell in it and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness so again you know the this is talking about the desolation uh, probably of Babylon I haven't gone back in and gotten the context of this but it's clear from the context that it's talking about something that got turned into a waste and and uh, emptiness okay so this this is key because it's telling us that the earth you know God didn't create it in vain I guess we'll see that here in a second Isaiah uh, 45 18 uh, he created a, a perfect creation he created you know Eden like condition and it was destroyed um, and that's what we're going to learn here so let's look at one more 40 uh, verse 17 here all the nations before him are as nothing and they are counted to him as less than nothing and and it says vanity but uh, waste or destruction so again it implies something you know here the case is the nations and they and they accounted to them as destruction or vanity um, you get that something exists and that gets torn down I guess is the real point so when you read those first statements in Genesis here in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness it's easier uh, to follow through then with the rest of the study if we said and the earth became um, a waste or a desolation okay and then darkness was upon the deep so definitely implies that something was destroyed I guess is beating that down now I spent so much time on that and showed you other verses because I think it's hard to believe that this is in the Bible because nobody teaches that interpretation of it at least you know again you'd have to go to the Chuck Misslers or you'd have to go uh, you know to the Pember book or whatever to get that understanding but uh, it's definitely what the words mean it just I guess it's uh, too uh, hooky spooky if you want to say for people to go there I mean that notion of evolution and things evolving out of an emptiness mass I think is so permeated our psyche that that people can't deal with this idea 
of of a creation and then God destroying it, wiping away, and a recreation. And that's really what's being implied as a recreation. And Pember does a good job in his book bringing that out. So now let's take a look at Isaiah 45, 18 here. <clears throat> okay. Isaiah 45, 18. Okay, and we'll leave the Strong's on for a minute here. For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, <clears throat> God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it, not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. And so <laughs> this is kind of telling you, isn't it? God created, you know, Garden of Eden-like, condition he did not he did not create it as a destruction in a wasteland and so to me this puts the nail in the coffin if you go back and you read genesis you know one one and two and especially in verse two where it talks about this this destruction that occurred and if this challenging your brain and you think no it must have been just an empty wasteland and and the the Holy Spirit then finished the creation process because the Holy Spirit hovered over the water, which would be probably what most people would teach it as. We we'll see right here that God did not create it to be a destruction. He created it um, and formed it and established it. He didn't create it as a destruction. And so the Bible itself is, you know, if you know these verses, is telling you God created something perfect. As a matter of fact, he probably created the earth with 360 day years as we find uh, was was the uh, months and all that before the flood. It was 360 day years. We did that in a prior study. And so the sun and the earth probably rotated around the sun in, in a in a non-elliptical orbit, probably in a cir circular orbit, it probably had evenly divided days. The earth probably had consistent temperature, right? Garden of Eden-like conditions and something happened. And now the earth's sitting at a tilt, tilt with an elliptical orbit and you have winters and typhoons and all sorts of problems, right? Okay. Now let's uh, just check here because uh, that H8414 is what's in Jeremiah there. Um, four. Verse 23, and this is where we started this whole study. <clears throat> there it is, Tohu. So um, it just, I guess, <laughs> when I read it to you the first time, I just figured, uh, you know, you, I was worried people were thinking I was twisting the text or something. But I just want to show you that this is these words are consistent, and this is probably the right interpretation of what happened to the earth. So does that kind of blow your mind? If you've never been exposed to any of this, I'm hoping it's blowing your mind or you probably don't care that much. But uh, let's go now and take a look at something now. We're going to go non-canon, non-canonical. We're going to take a look at uh, the book of giants, but it's easy because there's not much to look at. Um, here's uh, a <clears throat> Here's basically a, a theologian, Dr. C.K. Quarterman, and I have not studied his other stuff. What I liked about what I found here was he took the actual uh, text. Now, this book of giants, let's just read where it comes from. It's, uh, I don't know how to say it, Ogeus the Giant, also known as the Book of Giants, is a Jewish book expanding a narrative in the Hebrew Bible. Its discovery at Qumran dates the text creation before the second century BC. Okay, the Book of Giants, Dead Sea Scrolls, and it numbers the scrolls here, and you can compare that to Genesis 6. And so that's uh, the context. And then this is the reconstructed text. And I don't know how much artistic license had to be put into this because the base text, if you see the fragments, there was probably missing words in that, um, 
that they had to take from context and fill in the story. But what's interesting about this is it was in the Qumran caves with the rest of the holy texts. And so it's another one. It's kind of like the Book of Enoch that was also in the caves. It's not part of the canon, but it, it extends the story that is in the Bible. And so you don't have to treat this as biblical text to glean more information from it that probably supports the story we already have in the Bible. And uh, it's only this long. Okay, it's only basically it's down to here. I was very tempted to just to read it because <laughs> it's really neat. But I'll, I'll just uh, read this little portion here and then I'll make some general comments about the rest of it. The writing, uh, this is, uh, let's start at the beginning. The scribe Enoch gave Mawe a copy of another tablet um, that bore Enoch's own handwriting here. The writing on the tablet said, In the name of the great and holy God, this message is sent to Shamazahaza and all his companions. Let it be known to you, the giants and the monsters, that you will not escape judgment for all the things that you have done, and that your wives and their sons, and the wives of their sons, will not escape, and that your licentiousness on earth, there has been visited upon you a heavenly judgment. The land is crying out, complaining about you and the deeds of your children, and about the harm you have done to it until the heavenly angel Raphael arrives. Behold, destruction is coming by great flood, which will destroy all the living things, whatever is in the deserts and the seas. Okay, so you can see how that takes the biblical story and expands it. And one of the things I find is compelling is both this text and the book of Enoch, and I can't remember right now what's in Jasher, but that's another one that people tend to look at for some of these end time clues but it's definitely pointing to the giants were the rulers of the earth during this you know post Adam but uh, pre flood days and you can see here judgment was passed down and you can see a hierarchy that there's you know God the father presumably is sending a message to and then I don't know this Shem Mahaza and all of his companions, he was probably some sort of a uh, priest, whatever you want to say, probably, of the giants and the monsters. And the second thing you can get out of this, and it's it's throughout this text, is it wasn't just giants. <laughs> there was these things called monsters. And I think, you know, if you look at a lot of the speculation now, um, that this genetic engineering that's going on today, the transhumanism as being probably the same strategy that uh, the fallen angels employed back ages ago to corrupt the gene pool appears to be happening again. And it's not just creating, you know, giants, these half, you know, angel, half human things, but they're creating in this text, it's called, it calls them monsters, but, um, there's that notion potentially in the Bible as well. There's uh, say traps and some other things that are referenced in the Bible. It's a bit obscure, but it sure seems like there's things other than just giant, you know, half angel, half people, that there's hybrided other things. And again, the book of Enoch, uh, I think it is, makes that clear that they had these practices and created these other things. So I'd encourage you to come. I'll put the link down below. There's, I said I was going to outline this a little bit. Um, one of the things that's in here is a dream. And I'm just, it's curious to me because here I'll, I'll show you this vision that gets interpreted. I saw a tree uprooted for three of its roots. And while, as it were watching, some beings, and he's postulating that they're angels, moved all the roots into this garden. Uh, the interpretation of this dream is similar to that of the early one. This dream vision concerns the death of our souls and those of Gilgamesh and all of his companions. However, Gilgamesh said to me that all the foreboding concerning only the rulers of the earth, the temporal, powerful ones, whom the leader of the good angels has cursed. And so, again, it fits the 
biblical model, but I think it makes it a little bit more clear. So in the Old Testament, we know one of the, well, the great king is Nimrod, the original Gibor giant. A lot of people say that Gilgamesh is yet again another name for him. Uh, this might be implying the same. And uh, Gilgamesh actually earlier in here says he's called um, the wild man. It says it up here as he is known. So again, the Bible talks about him as being um, the, in rebellion against God. So that definitely could fit there. And then we see here that, you know, it's this leader, Gilgamesh, and all of his that are with him are the other giants and, and they're kings. And then again, in the biblical text, you have Og, who's the king of Bashan. Um, we know we had Goliath, right, that was the leader of the uh, Philistines at the time of David, slew him. And so you can go down these various Canaanite kings in the Bible, and you know, I haven't done all the genealogy on this, but um, I'm trying to think of the guy that's really dug into this. I'm okay, I'm blanking on his name, but um, there's a gentleman that's fairly famous right now that goes to a lot of conferences, and he talks about how these giants were all the tribes that were in Canaan. And it gives you a really good rationale for why when the the children of Israel were coming to the promised land, God told them to slay every man, woman, and child, is that gene pool was corrupted in there. And the, the leaders of those population groups were kings. And this is just confirming it right here. So I guess that's one reason to be looking at some of these other non-canonical yet, you know, biblically supportive text. I don't know how you want to categorize it, but that's what we got there. Okay. <clears throat> now we're going to jump over here to one other thing quick. Um, in the Hagman and Hagman show last night, the, one of the other things they pointed to is this curious thing that there's lots of ancient artifacts that point to a prior civilization. And one of the big questions is, is that, are those prior civilizations um, just pre-flood? You know, the Bible talks about how there was giants in those days um, and after, referring to before the flood and after the flood in that context. And so, you know, we've got the monolithic structures, the huge structures like at Baalback and like the Mayan ruins and all that where even today we can't, build cranes big enough to move those stones. So we know something happened. Great pyramids, the same. <clears throat> and so we know there was something going on, technology beyond what we have even today back then. Question is, was any of that even prior to Adam? Now that we have this context for the Bible, we can open that question up. And so maybe thoughts of like Atlantis was that pre-flood or was that potential even pre-Adam? And uh, I don't think we have any answers for that, but we've got this curious thing called the Sumerian Kings List. And uh, uh, again, it's a four-sided um, tablet. You can see the picture of it here. Trying to list all the kings um, throughout time. And the tablet dates uh, to around, yeah, here it is here. Uh, 2000 or so BC. So it's about 4,000 years old, they think this rock is. And I'm just going to read you this here. It says Sumer's mythical past. <laughs> the Sumerian king list begins with the very origin of kingship, which is seen at a divine inst as a divine institution. The kingship had descended from heaven. <laughs> Where have we heard this before? The rulers in the earliest dynasties are represented as rei uh, reigning fantastically long periods. After the kingship descended from heaven, the kingship was in Erudug. In Erudug, Eliam became king. He ruled for 20,800 years. El Alajar ruled for 36,000 years. The two kings ruled for 64,800 know, years. Some of the rulers mentioned in the earliest list, such as Etania, Lugobanda, and Gilgamesh, 
are mythical or legendary figures. Oh, really? <laughs> Those heroic feats are subject of series of Sumerian and Babylonian narr narrative compositions. The earliest list names eight kings with a total of 241,200 years from the time of the king when the kingship descended from heaven to the time when the flood swept over them and their land once more. The kingship was lowered from heaven after the flood. Okay, so <clears throat> going backwards, yes, after Noah's flood, we know there was giants in the land again. And, uh, you know, I found actually in, in pagan uh, historical recounting that uh, their version, their thought of Nimrod was that Nimrod's progenitor was a Satan, which the ultimate fallen angel, right? So again, this idea of falling or a kingship lower from heaven kind of fits that model. <clears throat> but now you've got, you know, you probably want to go back to 6,000 or so BC to when Adam was, according to the biblical text. But now you got these real long ruling and reigning going on, you know, tens of thousands of years, making up a total of 241,000 years. Now, what the interesting thing is, is, you know, they're trying to come up with why are there these interpretations, these extremely long reigns, and yet post-flood, the, the record is is accurate. Matter of fact, they've corrected a lot of their uh, archaeological his, historical uh, finds based on understanding that king's list. And so was it all made up mythical before then? And yet, there, you know, there's some specificity to it. And then it became accurate. I'm not trying to really imply too much from, from a rock that's non-biblical. I'm just saying it once again points us to non-human, right, prior to Adam kind of cities and towns and rulers. And when we look and we combine that with the Book of Giants, um, which is probably talking about after, after Adam, in that case, because it talked about that they were going to be judged by the Lord Almighty with a flood. You know, maybe that is Noah's flood, uh, or maybe it's a prior flood that was on the earth. And at Noah's flood, they had to, God gave them the rainbow to say, I'll never do it again. It would kind of make sense then, uh, because, you know, um, if there was more than one destruction by flood, for instance, giving a sign saying, I won't do it again, would actually be a, uh, what do you want to say? Fairly logical. So I'll just leave you with that. I'm not really trying to prove much, and I'm not saying I take 241,200 years to be some exact total. I'm just saying it's not inconsistent with what we're really seeing in the Bible and what it appears to be saying. And I think it would be odd that uh, the history would be completely made up in the beginning and yet be accurate after that. So uh, just giving you my two cents on that one. All right. So now um, we, we got, want to go into a couple more wacky passages and then we'll close it off here. Okay. And I said uh, wacky not to, as a pejorative to the Bible, but in terms of uh, tricky passages that generally aren't touched in the Bible or the interpretations people give are pedestrian compared to probably what the text is actually saying. And so that's in terms of wacky, it's that kind of confusion uh, in terms of interpretation that makes makes me a little crazy when I get into some of these passages. And if anybody's got a good um, commentary on Ezekiel 31, that doesn't try and turn this into just a pedestrian description. Um, I'd appreciate seeing it. <clears throat> um, I want to, you know, I'd love to go read this whole thing. You guys know I probably do that too much. But uh, let me just pick off a couple of these verses and then give you a little context, then we'll move on. Okay. <clears throat> so, the context here, Ezekiel 31. 
is this is on the heels of I think it's 29, 30, and then 31, where they're talking about what will happen to Egypt, uh, you know, prophetically through time, and it lands here I think in 31 with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, but he's right away called, behold, the Assyrian that was a cedar in Lebanon. And so immediately um, we pick up this notion of the Assyrian and he is a cedar in Lebanon. And so we know we have symbolic language and that goes through the whole text here. And we know that we're talking about the Assyrian. And again, some, some people, um, struggle with this notion of the Assyrian <clears throat> being the Antichrist. But if you do the study for yourself, I think you'll end up getting there. And the other thing I'll have to say is, um, at least in terms of my study and the text I've been through and the commentaries I've been through, this notion of the Antichrist being in the Old Testament as the Assyrian, I've only heard it taught by Chuck Missler before. Now, maybe other people have taught this, but then... You know, I saw this on Tom Horn's website with Peter Goodgame writing articles, and then <clears throat> I've seen it picked up since by by a bunch of other end time, you know, Bible teachers. And so I think this is a fairly new idea. And so I think if you're looking at commentaries from 20 years ago or older, I think there's just no chance that you're going to get this interpretation, this understanding, and that is consistent in Daniel. 12, we, that passage everybody loves to quote about uh, people going to and fro and knowledge will increase. <clears throat> that knowledge increasing definitely has an application on the Bible, especially from context, as well as just computers and general knowledge increasing. Knowledge of the prophetic is, is <laughs> probably a heavy component of what's being described there. And so going to real old commentaries to get these end time biblical themes is probably a little bit dangerous. I personally wouldn't go uh, much earlier than, you know, there was a big revival around prophecy, I guess, in the 70s and 80s. Um, guys like Dr. John Walvert is a great resource, but I think if you go uh, much earlier than that, you lose all this current day understanding now as they're as they're digging up you know skeletons and we're understanding from physics the multi-dimensional nature of the universe and all this type of thing you lose all that context and so i, I just think you know older commentaries aren't going to help that much for these kinds of texts now this pimber book that's why it was so amazing here in the mid to late 1800s he wasn't getting all the physics stuff maybe um, but he definitely, he caught on to this earth early age part and he talked about, uh, you know, the beings that must have existed and he speculates a little bit, but um, pretty amazing that he was doing it back then when just now we're really starting to uncover some of this stuff. So, okay, in Ezekiel 31, we've, we've got potentially the Antichrist talked about as the Assyrian. He is also in this text, the Pharaoh king of Egypt. And we know that Egypt is also used symbolically of the, of the Gentile world. Um, and, and that would be consistent in here. So uh, there's a little context. And the other thing I'll say is, is um, I've struggled with this text, how much of this is end time oriented or how much of this perhaps was historical. Like we were talking about before, pre-edemic, was there a prior flood? And, uh, you know, you can get into this. But this is a curious verse here, 14. <clears throat> to that end, uh, none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up their top among the thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, all that drink water, for they all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. So to me... Right there, this isn't taught. The destruction that's described in here of these tall trees, which which I'll argue are the Nephilim. These are Nephilim giants. Ha, is end time context because the children of men had to be part of this. So it, it had to be post flood. Is would be one interpretation of this. 
because they're being sent to the pit and they're being sent by God. And so that judgment that's sending them there potentially is our end time judgment. <clears throat> so let's go back up to the top here. I wanted to go through 2 through 15. Son of man, speak to King of Egypt and to his multitude. Okay, he's got a multitude. Whom are like thou in greatness? Behold, the Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with shadowing shroud and a high stature and as a top was among the thick boughs. The waters made him great and the deep set him upon high with her rivers running around his plants and sent out her little rivers unto all the trees of the field. So here you really get the context of that, that there's a generational trees here that are being supported by the waters from below and that's you know when you dig into that you see it's the abyss and so we we get the demonic realm supporting these trees which really are you know probably Gabor probably Nephilim <clears throat> here therefore his height was exalted above the trees of the field and his boughs were multiplied and his branches shot up it became long because the multitude of waters when he shot forth all the fowls of heaven made their nests in his boughs and under his branches did all the beasts of the field bring forth their young and under his shadow dwelt all great nations so there's one more confirmation that um, this isn't really talking about trees and a forest being sprung up this is symbolically referring to entities that were giants and that were proud being lifted up by the waters from beneath and you know in this case the demonic realm okay but his shadow dwelt all great nations and so we know that this is symbolic language for peoples that are in great nations thus uh, he was fair in his greatness and the length of his branches for his root was by great waters um, the cedars in the garden of God could not hide him the fir tree were not like his boughs. The chestnut tree were not like his branches, nor any other tree in the garden of God like in, unto his beauty. Now that sounds like um, probably like Satan there because they're talking about the garden of God. Um, so this is where, <laughs> again, we know that if the earth was formed in a non-fallen state and there were, if let's call them entities, non-peoples, in that old state, uh, having it be referred to as the Garden of God as a possibility, and so I get I struggle in here. I'm just being honest. Is this talking about Satan in a prior form um, in the pre-Adamic realm, and uh, how he was the king of? Because we know he's the king of the air, and he's the prince of this world still. What about before Adam was was he actually physically ruling and reigning? You know, I struggle, but some of this sounds like that. I've made him fair by the multitude of his branches, so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. Doesn't that sound like Satan? Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast lifted up thy height and hast shot up his top among the thick, thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in its height. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. And uh, I'm not sure <laughs> what the mighty one of the hand of the heathen is. He shall surely deal with him. He've, I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains and upon the valleys. And his branches have fallen and his boughs are broken and the river of the land, and all the people of the earth are gone down to the shadow. And now that sounds like our end time context again, uh, because we know he's cast to the ground and his body lays on the on the hillsides to be ridiculed. And, uh, you know, so I'm going to postulate here that, uh, that if we're talking about the Assyrian and he's the cedar, um, that... He, this is really probably talking about um, the original Nimrod and he was the king and all that. And um, I'm going to say it's, you know, before, 
I'm just going to leave it go at that. <laughs> I'm going to speculate too much and I can't back it up. I guess that's what I'm, I'm struggling with here. So um, let's just keep going down here in verse 12. And the strangers, the terrible the nations have cut him off and have left him upon the mountains. Okay, we read that. And upon his ruin shall all the fowls of heaven remain. So <clears throat> we've got the birds and the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height, neither shoot up the top to thick boughs, neither their trees stand up in their height, uh, all that drink water, for they are delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth in the midst of the children of men that go down to the pit. And so, you know, I struggle with this. I think we have the Antichrist here. I think, you know, it's somehow it's it's reflecting back of Nimrod, but we see that he's being fed from below from the abyss, so he's demonically charged. That uh, yet there's something about you know this notion of the garden of the of God. Nothing was like him, and this is why I talk about you know is this a manifestation of Nimrod returning or of Satan in his in his uh, pre-fallen state being referred to here. I just, these are tough verses for me, but I encourage everybody to dig into Ezekiel 11. Now, the broader point that I need to make is, you know, we use that hermeneutic of expositional constancy that uh, when the Bible uses symbolic language, that the sim symbols are used consistently throughout the rest of the Bible. And so now we have the Assyrian and his other trees that are in his garden being referred to as, you know, these entities being referred to as trees. So he's a cedar. He's got other cedars. He's got other trees of the field. And I think there was other references to, yeah, chestnut trees um, as well. And so if we think about that book of Kings, we know there was the giants, but then we also know there was something called the monsters in there. And so I really think this, if this has an end time context, we have the return of this old program. You're going to have a king. He's probably a non-human entity who is the Antichrist, somehow pointing us back probably to Nimrod. He has other giants with him. That's, that's these other trees that are growing up from his roots, being fed from, from the abyss down below. And we have other trees that are likened to him, like the chestnut trees that's referred to in here, that's very, you know, very well could be referencing other, you know, Nephilim, Raphim, uh, probably non-angel human, probably some sort of a genetic crossbreeding that's going on here. And again, be hard to prove, but if we use the symbology of these trees <clears throat> being malevolent, mean, um, in the context of probably this end time setting, I think we've got something interesting then that we can go look at. So let's jump down here now to Luke 21, verse 29. And he spake to them this parable, Behold the fig tree and all the trees. And when they now shoot forth, ye see and know for your own selves that summer is now at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is here. And I've dug into this before, and we'll look quickly at the Matthew 24 uh, reference. We know the fig tree is Israel, and when you know, Israel begins to spring forth, um, something else is beginning to spring forth. And that's my conjecture is this ties back to Ezekiel 31, and it's the Nephilim and, and the giants coming back. And we see this with the New World Order, and there's all sorts of rumors that uh, the Aryan race and the Nephilim are, are coming back. And it, now, is that the you also tied to the UFO stuff? Um, I'm not sure. But in Luke 21, we have the fig tree being referenced in all the trees. And Luke is writing to the Gentile and Greek. And uh, so that would make sense that he says when basically when Israel re is reborn, 
all the trees are being reborn and shooting forth their roots. And that's, you know, that's really what we've been seeing here in the end times. Now, Matthew parallel verses, um, it's being written to convince the Jewish people that Jesus was the Messiah. So let's go take a look at Matthew 24, because this now has the Jewish context, uh, verse 32 to 39. Okay. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. See, there's no other trees being referenced. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise, when you shall see all these things, know it's near even at the door. And that verily a city of this generation shall not pass till these things be fulfilled. So there you've got just Israel, just the fig tree being referenced. And again, that would make sense in context of what Matthew writes about. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Now, watch this. But the day and the hour no one knoweth. No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And I'll go two more verses. For as the days were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And people love to speculate what this is, but the days before Noah, now we have a lot better context. You look at the book of Kings, the references we made to the book of Enoch. You look at this structure that we went through tonight with the pre-edemic and then probably the, the uh, pre and post flood with the giants and now this makes a lot more sense and this is why we think that the Nephilim return and uh, we look at Ezekiel 31 and it, we definitely see an end time context with the trees representing those giants and they're in the end time context and that's what we could get right out of here as well so I think that's curious now and notice also that this comparison of the days of Noah doesn't exist in the Luke rendition. Now, I'll just speculate a little bit. With these synoptic gospels, the interesting stuff is all in what isn't in the other gospels, meaning what the differences are, because they sound very similar. It's the differences that are super important. And so in this case, we don't have the reference of Noah sitting there in Luke 21. And yet Luke is pointed toward, more pointed toward the church, is to the, the Gentile nation. And uh, so the fact that, does this give us a little hint that the church doesn't see the days of Noah? And just really speculating out loud, but you could definitely see that. Now let's finish with Psalm 82 and then call it a night. I know this has been a longer one, but hopefully it's been a little bit interesting. Uh, Psalm 82 is short. Psalm Asaph, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judges among the gods, which is angels in context. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and the needy. Deliver the poor and the needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, all of you children of the Most High. See, that's angels again. But ye shall die like men and fall like the one of the princes. Arise, O God, and judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all the nations. And I guess that just is a nice way to close it out that we see that we've got the fall of the angels being referenced in here, that they had responsibility over us humans, <laughs> but that, that they corrupted their ways. You know, they, they helped in us walking in darkness, and uh, the foundations of the earth are out of course. Does that reference, you know, some of those judgments and destructions we read about? And uh, God tells them, you are all children of the Most High, but you're going to die like men. And, uh, you know, that's part of the end time judgment. We see that uh, hell was made for Satan and his angels and they get cast into the lake of fire. So there's the end time final judgment. So hope this study was interesting. It was a longer one, uh, but I think there's some stuff in there. A lot of people 
uh, haven't ever heard before. So leave me comments below. And uh, if you can't tell, our salvation is way more amazing than I think uh, the average Christian would give it credit. If God had this program, and even if, if it goes all the way back pre-Adam, and there was angels and cities and other things that occurred pre-Adam, and then you look at he created man and recreated all of earth, and now he's going to redeem us, <laughs> us, you know, kind of wicked <laughs> humans uh, and make us children of God and that we're going to live with him forever. I think it just makes the gospel uh, just that much more amazing. So uh, if you haven't given your heart to the Lord, boy, now is the time. Be, be part of this huge redemption program. And uh, I guess God bless everybody. Good night.